Chapter 27 Interlude I The Second Generation She watched from above, from a high place that allowed her to see anything, from a place that made sure no one was able to see her. She watched as the entire troops came back, marching inside the capital, the people who managed to survive against one of the great demon beasts and come out from facing the so-called demon god that can destroy cosmos while still sane. She watched as people watched in awe, in astonishment as they saw the giant horn that practically dwarfed them, no one will deny or exclaim that it was farce after seeing that, the horn after all even longer than many houses combined together. She watched as the people entranced, enraptured by those who rode upon the earth dragons, mainly the royal candidate. However she was sure their focus was actually solely to the handsome man in blue with silver armor that was smiling slightly at them, and she admits, she also found herself awed by him. There is something about him that is, pulling others, like a king, and she is sure that no one will object if the man declared himself as king in there right now. However those worshipping and praiseful expressions morphed to slight horror when they noticed the girl that rode on his side. The silver hair, the violet eyes, and the ears that slightly pointed. No one won't recognize her appearance, they are described very well by the books of history after all, depicted very clearly about what the Witch of Envy has done to the world. Note slightly, because for some reason the fears and the horrified look are not as big as it's supposed to be. Now wasn't that surprising? Her eyes briefly wandered to the man that was on her side and they narrowed in a calculating manner. His presence. It was obvious that it was his presence that made the public not expressive as they should be. Influencing ability? No. No, she doesn't sense anything strange. As matter of fact, it is more like a natural thing, one that is eerily similar like hers. How? Interesting, was it gifted to him? Or was it just his natural disposition? She watched as some child, a boy, stumbled in his way, he trying to sneaking among the mass, among the group, he manages to do that of course, however the problem is he tripped on his path and fall out from the people, landed on the ground in a painful manner few feet away from the carriage. She watched as everyone paused, the man in silver armor briefly glancing at the boy's direction, then he shifted his gaze to half-elf on his side, only to find she was already missing, she hold back a giggle seeing this, and right now the silver-haired girl approaching the fallen boy. Then the half-elf gives her beautiful smile to the boy and kneels to his level, her hand glowing and the boy's wound gone in an instant. She watched as she returned to her ride, with the public watching her in a mix of awe and slight terror. The knight in blue and silver admonishes her act as she returns but there is no heat in his expression, as matter of fact he looks approving. She watched the half-elf put on a sheepish look for a moment before her face morphed to a soft and yet elegant expression, her back straightened and her posture was firm, like the man before her. She still remembers how that half-elf used to be an obnoxious little girl who was crying, bawling and spewing words of hatred to her, how she howled in rage as she froze everything that was close to her, forest, animal, people, and even soul if she wanted to. But now, here she is. Riding on top of an earth dragon, looking proud and strong. The experiment is a success. She said, eyes never leaving the group beneath her. Gluttony won't be able to complete anymore, his sword completely obliterates the witch gene to the point it won't reappear. She turned around and faced the entity that floating behind her, we dash. She didn't have a chance to speak any further as an invisible force choked her, her throat twisted in an inhumane angle almost like a screw, her eyes widened and she clawed her neck as if trying to remove the invisible constriction in there. Your experiment is a failure. The goddess of cosmos, Gaia, spoke with contempt, there is no change in her facial expression but one can tell that she is clearly very displeased. I managed to peek into that book, and he gets something worse than the Witch of Envy. If he was able to use that power then we might as well release her from her prison. The woman who gasped for breath narrowed her eyes, then everything around her became distorted and her body gone, only to reappear soon and she looked fine and healthy as if her neck never twisted in such an angle. So he was looping. She said in a tender voice. I did say it was risky. That is not simply just risky. This is exactly what we should avoid in the very first place. And yet, thanks to you, we now have another monster lurking on the corner. With that power, he is out of my and your boundary. There is literally nothing we can do if he went berserk in that state. Your experiment causes the birth of a monster that is on par with the first one or even worse seeing he has his mind. There is nothing we can do about that. She replied calmly, despite standing in front of the goddess that was fully enraged she was able to maintain her composure. It was risky, and we can't control it, we don't have many options, our experiment is limited as well. We need to take drastic measures to see how his power works. Drastic measure. 
I can't just simply send Hakugiai to him, he will straight butcher him just like what he did, the second generation pretty much is far more versatile and stronger than their predecessor. She defended, her voice still eerily calm and soothing. You know as well that this will be risky, we are playing with power that outside from our boundary in the first place, there will be consequences, that is inevitable. The goddess earth colored eyes staring at her blues. While not showing it, she can taste the deity's disdain toward her. Do not by any means make him able to access his power. Force him to loop as many as you want but make it harmless. I can't guarantee that. We are dealing with an unknown force here after all. There is a chance that the percentage he will be able to use that power will increase, but I'm sure I can make it so he won't have access to it. See that you do, you were called the first by my predecessors not for without reason and I hope you live up to that title. And with that declaration the goddess is gone, disappearing as if she were never there, leaving the first alone. She promptly turned around, her eyes focused back on the parade beneath her. A girl who is labeled by the world as a half-devil, destined to be the one that holds key for the seal, strong but fragile, beautiful but ugly. A tragic child that was forced to be an adult because of a mistake of the past. A man who does not belong in this world, strong, unyielding in pursuing his goal. Yet in reality, only a boy that was forced to become a mockery of what he was supposed to be. Fighting for something that he believes to belong to him. And then there was another too, one of the twins. The one that is kind, soft, believer yet also selfish, a girl that is always behind and ready to support whenever those she holds dear fall, yet needs flawed people so her existence has meaning. And her twin that is in the manner and not there, the older twin that is prideful, harsh, and firm, a pillar for their souls, yet also weak and seeks for others that are similar like her so she can share her burden. Not just end in those four, there are many possibilities from others as well. Such as that girl who was chosen by artificial echidna, that girl who was labeled as lion, and that luckiest girl in the world. Each of them holds potential in the future and will hold an important role for him. And of course there is her puppet too, can't forget about her puppet who now holds quite a role as well. Really, she never thought that her puppet was successful like that. Smile slowly fluttered across her beautiful face. We are going to have quite fun in the future Aaron Pendragon, I am looking to spend my time with you, oh holy sword wielder. Did you hear the rumor? Rumor? About what? About what happened in Lugnica? He perked up when heard the name of the Dragon Kingdom mentioned, however he did not show it visibly and only silence while playing with his drink. The rumor about some kind of demon god or something like that? Yeah, about that one. What to say about it? It's only a rumor, nothing else. Only rumors. He would incline to agree had he did not sense the massive dark and wicked aura from where he was a few days ago by himself. Dunno man, I mean, I heard it was pretty hardcore. Look, probably nothing, Lugnica has been closing themselves and only few who are able to enter it, only big and rich guys that are able to. So that rumor was probably only made by them for the sake of politics. Huh. You don't know. Lugnica has now already started to open again. Wait, what? Seriously? Yeah, the rumor pretty much spread just because it opened, duh. Interesting. It seems he won't need to use illegal ways or do very hard labor to enter the kingdom anymore. Though he sure it still won't be easy, the kingdom just opened after isolating themselves for quite a long after all, since their royal family's death. There will be few documents or requirements for someone like him to enter that place. And there is a rumor that they have some kind of demigod too. Demigod? Like the nine gods? No, nothing like that, this is a real demigod. It said he is related to their dragon. Another interesting thing. It seems his decision to take a break here was not fruitless, he must say it was quite enlightening in fact. How much? He asked as he gestured to the foods and drinks on his table. That would be one silver three copper coin. The owner of the pub said. He paid for the food and stood. He adjusted his cape slightly to make sure it was comfortable. Briefly he noted the owner's eyes glanced to his weapon, and they filled with a bit incredulous. Well, he can't blame him for that. His choice of weapon is a bit strange after all. Deciding it was enough, he picks up his weapon then he goes out of the pub. So there is really someone running things in the background huh? Well, he already knew about that ever since he sensed something watching him but still. It was then his eyes caught a couple who seemed to be fighting, he saw the man holding the woman's arm while yelling at her. Narrowing his eyebrow, he walks toward their direction. Is there some problem here? He asked. The man turned to him, so did the girl, however the latter face filled with plea and fear. Piss off. 
Nothing concerning you. The man growled. I think it is. He said smoothly. Why are you harassing this lady? The man glared at him and opened his mouth, however he shut it and shot a look at the woman he held. This so-called lady. He spat. Has debt that she has yet to pay. She owes me money and it has already passed her timeline. J just three more days. The woman begged. I only need three more days. I swear I will pay for it. And where will you get three gold coins in three days? The man asked sarcastically. Even if you sell yourself I doubt you will get that amount of money in a short time. The woman only whimpered in response while looking down, one hand crossing over her chest, and he couldn't help but agree with the man. While this woman is not ugly but she is also not that pretty, and her body is average at best. I will pay for her. He said. The man turned to him with a strange look. You will. Yes, three gold coins right? Here. He pulls out his coins and extends it to the man. The debt collector stares at the money before he takes it and he releases his grip on the woman. Hmph, fine then. He said with a grunt, his voice though no longer carrying heat like before. You look like a decent person, I give you one piece of advice kid, this woman is nothing but a drug addict. She's going to be in debt again in the next few days, trust me. With that said the man walked away, leaving him with the woman that was looking down. He turned to her. Are you okay, miss? I. I am okay. She stuttered. T thank you, thank you for helping me. No problem. He said. Was that true what he said? Are you a drug addict? No. She denied vehemently, I'm not. I. I. It's just a rumor. I. She let out choked sobs as she hung down her head in shame. He stares at the woman that is crying, then he glances in a certain direction, for a moment he is only silent as if contemplating something. Then he turned back to her. This is money for you to start fresh. He said as he dropped three holy coins. You're not a drug addict but you're a user. It's better to drop that style of living and start to build something that is beneficial for you. W what? H how did you dash? Life is hard and it is easy to run away, but believe me, in that hardness there is equal payback. He cut her with a lecturing voice yet also gentle. I give that money to you as a sign of trust, I trust that in the future when we meet again you will become someone with stature. I. I. He stood and fixed his cape once again, his hood fluttered by the wind, revealing a white hair beneath it. I will take my leave then. See you in the future later, miss. With that said he turned and walked away, leaving the woman who stared at the money in her hand. Lugnika. Perhaps I can find my answer there. He thought as he adjusted his mask, the wind of desert is not good for health after all, and he didn't want to get sand stuck to his face. Do you sense it my friend? Did you sense that power a few days ago? It's hard to not sense it. He replied dryly, that amount of power. It's almost like an invitation or some giant fireworks. There is no way he is unable to sense what just happened a few days ago. That vile and dark horrendous energy, just sensing it enough to make his whole body screaming in alarm and tempt him to run. Just thinking about it once again makes him shudder. However not long after that aberration energy came out, another rose. And the opposite of that dark energy, this one is pure, powerful, warm, holy even. If he makes into comparison it is as if yesterday some kind of vile demon just came out from the gate of hell and in response, God sent his personal warrior to raise and deal with it. And deal with it they did. There no more trace or any lingering of that vile energy, the holy power he senses destroyed it completely. No wonder the one he served was excited, he himself was also quite eager to meet the person who was able to do that actually. It comes from Lugnica. The person was practically shaking with excitement. I knew that contacting them was a very good idea. Luck was on our side, we will be able to meet the Sword Saint and the Holy Sword Wielder as well. Reinhard van Astria the Sword Saint. He admits that he is really interested to meet him too. What kind of man is he to be called, Saint? Does Lugnica already give their answer? They did my king. He said. We can arrange a meeting in the next three weeks. Three weeks. The king frowned slightly. Can it be hastened? That would be unwise in my opinion, Lugnica just opened from their isolation, they did this probably because they also need to screen those who enter their place. This is for our security as well. I see. The king hummed and let out a sigh after a moment. Well, I guess I can wait for three weeks.
You need to control yourself more, your majesty. He said with a chuckle. No need to lecture me in that part one no. The king replied in a voice that contained no heat. Anyway, I will go to see what Mama Oddglass do. She is probably playing with children again like usual. He stated. Well that was fine, Mama Oddglass always found a way to make things fun. The king laughed a bit. Anyway, tell Klaus San that I'm with her if you meet him. You should tell him by yourself. He deadpanned. However the king ignores him and walks away while humming merrily, making him shake his head. Seriously, he can't believe that person used to be one of the most hated rulers in history according to what they said. The behavior clearly shows the very opposite of how it is supposed to be. Lugnika ha. He thought. He, himself, is actually quite eager to go there. He wants to see the kingdom, the land, and everything else, it will be quite a sight to behold, he always loves to travel around after all. The reason why he stayed in Gustico is because this kingdom needs him, however now he has a chance to go out. He really wants to go there as soon as possible. I see. So you want to hunt dragon? He mused with an interested voice, you do know it will be hard right? I don't want to kill him, I just want to capture him. She said genuinely. Capture is harder than assassination. Only for a few days it's fine, I just want to spend time with him, making sure he has my mark. What are you? Some kind of animal in heat? He asked in an incredulous voice. Then he shook his head with exasperation. Anyway, we don't have a spare man. What you ask right now can be considered as breaking the rule. The king won't approve this. He said. But since you already proved to be quite successful in doing your mission. I guess I can help you. He sighed as he went over the document, searching for a certain paper and he found it. Here, bring this to our contract in Kararaji, you will get to meet them, but I'm not sure whether they will help you or not. She takes the document with a smile, her eyes filled with joy. It's fine, I just want to meet them before deciding my move so it is not quite a big deal. Yeah, yeah, how about your little sister though? Ah, uh, she will join me too I believe, she is quite interested in him as well. Damn, that man really has some bad luck huh? He whistled, to attract both their attention. Well if you were done then I wish you good luck, Elsa. Elsa Granheert smiled demurely at her friend. Thank you. Interlude 2. The world that abandoned, how could you? You left him. You left him there. With that monster. How could you? How long has it been? Ram has no choice, it was Aaronsama's wish, it was what he wanted. That was what she thought as she walked around the dead and ruins around him, her white cape billowing from the wind, her hood briefly revealing a few strands of her silver hair. Liar. You hate him. You hate him. Even if he already saved your life, you still hate him. It should be you who left behind. Not him. Never him. How long has it been since she stepped over to this place again? Nine years. Her mind supplied the answer as she stopped in her tracks, her violet eyes briefly darted to a certain direction, to an area that seemed familiar. And she walks onto it, her legs move forward, slow and steady, her eyes locked to something that she recognizes, despite it having long lost its shape but for her it is so familiar, it is something that has been so long. She stopped as she arrived at her destination, her eyes glanced at what she found. It was a ruin. It is filled with nothing but broken woods that used to be a house a moment ago, and all of them have black tinted color on various spots, indicating burnt marks. It was nothing but tatter and ruin of remaining what once had been houses. But for her. She still remembers clearly just what this place was supposed to be. An alley. Excuse me. Yes? Have you happened to have seen someone that was running around this area? I've been robbed and I've tried to find the thief but I lost their track. Well, I do believe I saw the thief. Really? Yes, it's a small girl around this tall, she has long blonde hair, red eyes, and is wearing a long red seal, covered by a black tube top and brown leather jacket. She jumped onto the rooftops of those buildings. She's probably already behind those walls. An alley. Where she met him for the first time. Aaron. Just call me Aaron. No, sir, and the likes. I'm too young to be called that kind of stuff. She still remembers clearly that time, remembers the man's sheepish smile and awkward behavior, remembers how he offered her his help and she accepts it. Their first meeting doesn't have any special impression to be honest but she admits it has its own charm. It was awkward, strange, clumsy even, but at same time also fun and bright. 
She likes it. It reminded her just how things used to be. This is where you meet him. The voice of her friend, her closest friend after him, broke her out from her nostalgia and she turned around. She was still clad in her maid uniform, which is not changing, however her hair did as it was no longer short and bob style but long and tied into a low ponytail. She also grows a bit taller and her beautiful face blossoms further, now she looks so mature and like a proper lady. She still has her cute and baby face though, something that she is proud of. Yes, this is where I met him for the first time. She spoke softly, her violet eyes filled with nostalgia. Rem C. Well, for some reason Rem is not surprised that your highness met Eren Sama for the first time in this kind of place. No need to call me that. The highness responded, voice bitter and sad. You're my friend Rem, you have the right to call me by my name. But even so Rem respects your highness too much to call her in such a manner. Rem replied in an equal voice. Perhaps if we are in a closed area, but in here? And what does matter anyway? She snorted, voice carrying slight sarcasm. There's no one here. She gestured to the dead ruins around her. And she can't be more than right, there is nothing around them, nothing but rabble, broken woods, blackened spots and destruction, the place around as if just being used as stomping ground by giants. And this place used to be the capital city of Lugnica, the strongest kingdom in the world. Ironically it was the first kingdom that fell as well. But at the same time it is also the luckiest kingdom, for at least they all die in an instant, not suffer for years like others that are stripped one by one, layer by layer, and the people inside them driven to endless despair. I never thought I would be back here. The half-elf murmured. After what we went through. Rem is only silent as she stares at the half-elf's sad face. She, herself, also still remembers very clearly how things go for them. Nesama why? Why? Why you? Eren Sama. Eren Sama is. She remembers them very well. They flee from Lugnica the next day when they all woke up, reluctant and unwilling, but at least they have enough sense to not stay in place that has monster who soon will destroy the continent, their life no longer theirs after all, they belong to the man that has saved them and he want them to survive from whatever that kill him, so they escape. They went to Kararaji, hiding in there, tending their injuries and trying to survive. It was a hard time for them, for everyone, for the world itself. And what makes it very bad is things did not go better for them, only worse. But what the worst for her and Lady Amelia? Is how they blamed Ram when they learned to leave the man they loved to die in the hands of a monster. Granted Rem herself did not stay angry for long, and she also did not blame her big sister completely. She knew that Aaron Pendragon must be the one who truly make that decision and it also hurt her big sister so much deep inside despite she did not show it to anyone that she was responsible for leaving the man that was worthy to be called a friend after years of only spending time with her and Roswell Sama. And perhaps. In some twisted way. Her big sister can see a future where she and Aaron Pendragon become closer and turn into something more than friends. But Lady Amelia was another case. She was pretty much blaming Ram, and her mentality at that time was unstable, for some reason she developed some kind of two personalities or something like that. One moment she was bawling and throwing tantrums here and there, the next she was cold and unforgiving like some kind of dictator or tyrant. It takes a year for them to fix her condition, both her and her sister stay at her side, even if Lady Amelia hates and treats them unfairly but they stay there for her. No, not just for her but for the man that has opened their world and sacrificed his life so they can survive and see the next son with a smile, for she is his legacy, the only thing that remains about him. And they cannot lose that. But in that spawn of the year, the world has thrown itself into chaos. With Lugnica as good as gone there was a sudden shift of power in the world. Balance was broken, people became greedy, warmongers stirred and hungry for blood, war threatened to break out. The only thing that prevents a full-scale war between Kararaji, Gustico, and Valachia, is that there are few powerful people who prevent them directly by stopping their act. Especially Valachia. It was said their army that tried to invade another continent was decimated by a single man, crippling even Cecilus Segmunt the Blue Lightning and the strongest of nine god, and also killing three of them. Gustico though. They closed themselves in an instant for unknown reasons and fortified their kingdom. The king basically ordered a complete shutdown all while also keeping an eye on foreigners that come to their place. As for Kararaji. Well they did the same things and lucky for them that they managed to sneak onto the kingdom first before it closed itself from outside. But even there no full-scale war but the world was not in peace, there were countless attempts of sabotage and assassination from each kingdoms, mainly Valachia, who trying to weaken one another. 
Kararaji is the main target as it was the most fertile and rich land due to its stable climate unlike the others who were desert and arctic land. Of course they meet fierce responses from Kararaji, how exactly it happened and the details about the event is not known by them, it is apparently a very big secret. But that was not the worst thing that happened. One year after Lugnika died, something came out from the remnant of that land. And whatever it was. It was worse than even the Witch of Envy. Rem and Amelia can personally attest to this as they still remember what they have seen. After the incident, Lugnika was considered off-limits for an unknown reason. Even Valachia, who is infamous for their sturdy head, did not touch the land of their former nemesis. And even if they did, the same man who decimated their army was there and prevented them from entering the land as he said it was too dangerous. And at that time, there is a rumor that someone came out from the remnant. Someone who was clad in blue that was covered by silver armor. There were no words to express the hope and joy that filled their heart at that time when hearing that. Aaron, I knew. I knew. You're not dead. You can't be dead. I knew it. Aaron Sama. Aryam. Aryam. Remso. And also there are no words to express the terror and horror that sink to their heart when they meet the being. Crimson liquid splattered over their faces that just looked above after burst of wind knocking them, their eyes widened, filled with utter confusion, terror and denial as they watched armored hands sprout out from the stomach of the woman that become pillar of their existence. You. Pink eyes consist of nothing but hatred, so much hatred that surpassing even her fury to witch cult. They bore to the blank and hollow green emerald that looked down at her. You're not him. She spat, they would need a new word for her tone as, venom, is too beautiful to match it. You're wearing his skin, his face. The blank eyes that dull slowly shifted, their green color morphed to pale golden and crimson red, dark sadistic glee filled them, his lips curled to sneer so ugly that was unmatched with his face that was usually gentle and mischievous. Always the smart one, of course you will notice it, I expect no less from you Ram. He spoke with a leer and disgusting voice, then he pushed his hand further to her stomach, digging into her flesh painfully and making her cough another mouthful of blood. You're right, I'm not him, I am what he's supposed to be. Then he raises his other hand slowly, deliberately taking his time, his teeth seem to become sharper almost like the fangs of a monster. The pink-haired demon notices what is intention, she quickly snaps her head to their direction, eyes wide and face screams warning. Run both oh dash, a swift blur of silver from his hand cut her from speaking any further as her head flung upward, decapitated completely with one simple movement. It fell to the ground with thud and rolled on the dirt below like some kind of ball. He pulled out his hand from her body with a sickening sound, splattering crimson liquid everywhere, and he uncaringly dropped the body that used to be someone who was very close to him in the past as if it was trash or some kind of garbage. Then he turned to them, his crimson blood and pale golden eyes filled with sadistic glee over their horrified and terrified faces. He takes gleeful steps forward in their direction. And a flame sphere that was so bright like a sun soaring from behind them and smashed to him. Until now. It is still fresh in their minds. Even eight years have passed but if they think about it, it seems like just yesterday much to their horror, it is like a nightmare that clings and haunts them every single night. The lifeless eyes of Ram that stare back at them and her headless corpse with hole in stomach is so vivid to the point they can remember all the details about it. And the pain. The pain. Oh gods. They were able to recover when Aaron left them. When he was gone, Ram was there, burdened, sarcastic, and rude but she was there for them. Even her method can be said to be unhealthy and not the best but she was there, with them, together with them. And now she is gone as well. It was a miracle that they did not kill themselves after that. The pain that they went through was too much. Too much. They just wanted over, wanted to end, be done with it and join with her and the man they love. Stand up you two. Didn't you two already owe that man something? And now you two also owe that demoness as well. You two are the last hope we have. I wonder, do you two even grow or get maturer in the first place after losing him? Is this what they both want? For you two to spend your time crying after they are gone. Surprisingly that was spoken by someone who they never thought of in the first place, or in Amelia's case, someone who she wished to die in the very first place. And then they learn the truth. Amelia really tried to kill her at that time, she really did, she almost repeated what happened to Elior Forrest in the past. Even so. They can't. No matter what, they can't become that person's enemy because they need that person in the first place, they need to be prepared, they need help. 
And it was hard for them, especially for Amelia, her pride and ego, she doesn't want to accept help from someone that has taken everything from her. But in the end they accept the offer. Because they don't have anything else. They realize that their normal and peaceful life that Aaron hoped for them is gone and has no meaning anymore, not after they lose Ram. And so they started their training, under watchful eyes of the Witch of Vainglory, they struggled, they pushed themselves. The Witch herself doesn't go easy on them, make no mistake their training was anything but gentle, it was brutal, hard, filled with insults and derogatory words, they lost count just how many times they nearly die under her grueling torture. But while they started their training, the creature who wearing skin of the man they love apparently did not stay idle, he roaming around and terrorizing the world. Not terrorizing in term of, hit and then run, no, he terrorizing in, come, conquer, and torture, term. Valachia was the first one that fell. The whole kingdom was wiped out only in a matter of days. He killed everybody without exclusion. Doesn't matter if it's children, women or men, he slaughters them all without exception, mounting their heads to the pike on the bordering land of the empire so those who want to come and challenge him can see the result of his gruesome and cruel deed. But it's not end there. It was fine if he only killed them all but it did not end there. Apparently that damn monster was still not satisfied with only such things, no, he left the survivors and started to rule them. No. It cannot be called rule, it more like torture. Under his so-called rule, Valachia was anything but peaceful, he let the former empire to be engulfed in chaos, he let the people inside them to sate their own greed and carnal desire, he made people who were in chaos and turmoil to do whatever they wish. Theft, murder, blackmail, torture, rape, pillaging, everything that inhumane and immoral was allowed. And the people of Valachia succumbed to it. Make no mistake, there are those who raise, those who stand out, those who brandish their weapons and become protectors to those who need it, they build something like a resistance group to survive in that hell. And that monster let them be, let them succeed, let them do whatever they wish. Only for three months at best before he crushed them all and let the insane and immoral people take everything they protect for. It was a repeated cycle after that. That monster gave people false hope, let them have some sense of peace, let them feel safe and happy, let them feel joy once again, but when they all have that, that monster comes from his throne and destroys everything they love and sense of peace. It was to say that Valachia was a kingdom for rabid animals without any sense of morality other than humans. And that monster laughed, that monster cheered, that monster fed in chaos and despair of mankind, he corrupted and blackened people's hearts beyond redemption, turned them into monsters wearing human skin. Only for three years before he destroyed and sunk the entire half of Valachia's continent and walked away, leaving nothing but death and despair in his trail, unto Kararaji. They meet him there for the second time, and they are backed by the army of Kararaji and Gustico. It was not enough. They were able to fight him, able to stall him, able to stand on the same ground against him with the help of many, they even got help from the man who saved them in the first place, the man who was responsible for decimating Valachia's army at their prime. But it was for naught. They are able to push him back, able to wound him, but they cannot kill him. Make no mistake they came close, they came very close, they were able to injure him severely even in his monstrous form, they managed to bring him down from his throne and they were so close, so close to the point they can taste victory, they just need to deliver one last strike. But one slip. And everything down to hell. And what's worse? It was her, it was Amelia's fault. Her mistake. Her hesitation caused the monster to have a chance to recover and slay three of their best warriors, forcing them to retreat as that monster managed to free from his restraints. A chance to save the world. And she blew it up. She was really useless. Even just remembering it now. Everything could be over. Their suffering. Their long journey. All could be over had she not hesitated, people would be in peace once more had she delivered that strike without hesitation. Amelia Sama. Rem called, using her name for the first time as she sensed the turmoil inside her. Don't call me that. Amelia replied, her voice bitter, sad, and filled with self-loathing. Amelia dies when she fails and hesitates to kill that monster. I am Sadella now. Sadella. The name of the Witch of Envy. The name that loathed so much ten years ago. Now that name is the one who unites the world together to stand against the monster that is worse than the witch herself. Amelia adopts that name, adopts that persona, as her sin is too much, her sin is equal to which of envy the moment she lets that monster escape, out of their grasp after years of suffering. And at same time she also uses, Satella, name so the remnant witch's cult follows her order, they need every person they have after all when that monster returns to have his revenge. 
and return he did, six months after their grievous battle he came back. And he has not played with them since the beginning, he strikes without hesitation. And they lose. Kararaji has fallen under his grip as well. Only Gustico remains. How ironic that the kingdom who used to be land for abandoned people become the last bastion for mankind and demi-human. Emilia-sama. Rem repeated, uncaring how the silver-haired half-elf clenched her fist as her name uttered. No matter what, Emilia-sama will always be Emilia-sama to Rem, that will never change until Rem dies. Emilia was only silent at that statement, her face holding a distant expression, her eyes filled with sadness, yet there was some glimmer in there, a sign that she was happy hearing Rem's word. Thank you R.E.M. Emilia replied kindly. Always Emilia-sama. Rem said with a bow, then she tilted her head, to a certain direction, where once the castle of the most powerful kingdom resided, her eyes sharpened and her nose twitched once. Emilia-sama. I know. Emilia's voice becomes sharp as well, her expression tightened, and there is dark emotion across her eyes. He is coming. Should we approach him? No, let him come, I'm sure the moment we arrive here he is already aware of our presence. And so they waited while facing a certain direction together, their posture and stance looked relaxed and uncaring but the expressions on their faces spoke anything but those. We went through so much suffering, went through struggle after struggle. Rem spoke in a whisper. Emilia-sama, know that Rem is happy to know Emilia-sama and Rem is proud to call Emilia-sama as Rem's sister. The half-elf glanced at her companion briefly through the corner of her eyes, then a small and gentle smile appeared from her face. So do I R.E.M. She murmured back in a tender voice. So do I. Ah, that was very sweet of you. A familiar voice in a sickening tone joined their conversation, just hearing it enough to make the half-elf and the oni to bristle, their eyes snapped to where the voice came from and see their adversary come out. He appeared from one of the ruined buildings, walking out in a relaxed manner. No longer his armor silver and blue like the first time they saw him, no, the armor is black like the abyss itself, the design was horrendous and demonic, a mockery of what it looked like in the first place. There are various red tints around it, they're pulsating, shimmering with a crimson eerie light. His once golden sprinkled colored hair now becomes one shade paler. His skin which was originally healthy and smooth now became pale as well, but the pale was on another level as he looked like someone who had his body lacking sunlight. His emerald green eyes now turned to heterochromatic, where the right is amber gold and the left crimson blood. And his face. It remains unchanged. Even though it has been years ever since their last meeting but he still remains young and handsome, it is as if time never influenced him. But to Amelia and Rem, his handsome face is the ugliest thing in the world. I'm surprised that you two come here. He exclaimed, voice cheerful and nonchalant. If I recall, I have said that I will pay Gustico a visit later. Seeing you all supposed to be the last bastion of humanity or something like that. He spoke of the bastion word with insult and leer. But what do I see here? The last strongest warriors of the world come here to seek their own death. He shook his head in exasperation before smirking. Or, do you two come here to join me? To bask me in your two feeling? In your dream? Amelia spat, her voice filled with full hatred and dark emotion, very opposite to her angelic and beautiful face. The thought of you touching me. It made me want to scrub myself using iron. Rem's delicate and beautiful body is to be touched by someone who is great and magnificent, certainly that person is not scum like you. Rem added with equal voice and cold glare such hatred. He replied, voice calm and seemed not offended by the hostility. What have I done to you too Emmy Dash? Don't. Call. Me. That. Amelia shouted, her composed face turned to snarl, violet eyes glimmering with restrained power. Don't you dare. To call me that. She repeated, her nostril flaring. That name. That name is only for him, it is what he used to call me. You who wore his skin and spat on his ideals and dreams, you have no right at all. In response to such anger and fury, the man in black armor only laughed, his laugh filled with glee and mockery. All right, all right, no need to be so angry dear, I will call you Satella then, Satellitan. He said with twinkling eyes. Though it is a bit strange, seeing I already consume the real Satella and devour all witches for real this time except for Pandora of course. He stated. And Echidna. He chuckled, it was filled with a dark glee and sadistic tone. She said she was curious about how death is, she wanted to know how it feels if it could be experienced many times. 
I make sure she regrets her curiosity, I really enjoy my time with her. He declared. The half-elf and the oni stare at him with pure disgust, as they know just what kind of foul and disgusting deed he had done. Not to mention Pandora had explained everything to them, just what kind of being that stands before them right now and everything else. She also explains how the original Witch of Envy manages to fight against the monster that comes after Eren Pendragon in the first place but the witch cannot defeat it with only a shade of her strength, and so she decides to lure it to where she is sealed and manage to swallow it fully. But what she did not expect is the insanity and the alien nature of that monster corrupting her further. And thus the monster that stands before them now is born. It doesn't matter, because today is the end of your terror. Amelia spoke with fury. Oh, I've heard that one before. He replied, voice filled with glee. It was at our second meeting I believe, but I seem to be doing fine now. His lips curled to sneer. Thanks to you Satellitan. For a moment Amelia sees red, and she is about to lunge at him in rage, however she forces her emotion down, she can't let the anger to blind her, reckless attack will end with her death if she fights against him. Anyway, are you two really intend to do this now? He asked again. There are still five years for Gustico before I raise it like the others. Why did you come here now? Why not wait for later? Make better preparations or things like that? It doesn't matter. Amelia said coldly. You will be dead by the end of this day, Jormungandr. That was what they called him now, Jormungandr. It wasn't their idea, there was a legend about it from land beyond Great Waterfall according to others who come from that place. The dragon that rose in the apocalypse and slain a god. You and your so-called heroes and army come to fight me and lose. Jormungandr laughed. What made you think just the two of you were able to beat me? We will. Amelia stated. And with that declaration, the half-elf sprung forward, a trail of blue magical energy burst out from her back, her hood blown, revealing her long hair that tied into a single high ponytail. She appears in front of the man in less than a second, an invisible sword clutched in her arms and without hesitation she swings it down. It meets against another steel, obsidian black in color with red lines that like glowing veins crossed on its edge. The black knight seems nonchalant about the attack, his face practically shows boredom. The man in black armor twisted his arm a bit, then he put strength in there and with a single move, he pushed back the woman without much effort. He moves his sword again, coating it with dark abyssal mana and swinging it to a spike ball that rattles in air and soars at him, blocking it easily. Then Amelia sprung forward, ice coated the ground beneath her as she glided herself in there, combined with mana that exploded from her once again, she arrived just after Jormungandr parried Rem's weapon and she delivered a piercing attack. However Jormungandr's arm came back as soon as it moved, the black obsidian sword was only inches away from beheading Amelia and the half-elf just in time to duck, avoiding the attack. But Amelia did not stop there. She controlled her ice, made it not only freeze the ground but the water vapor on the air itself, creating a path for her to glide above and she followed it, she quickly spun to behind Jormungand and delivered a powerful strike to the back of his neck. A powerful burst of dark energy burst out from Jormungandr's entire body, blasting the air and everything around him, and following it is his movement as he spins, his hands clutching his sword and he delivers powerful swing, blocking Amelia and at the same time also blow her away with his pure strength, sending the half-elf crash to near ruins. He doesn't give a chance to stop or rest for a moment as just when he blows her rem already sprung toward him. Morningstar's chain rattled in the air as the ball of spikes launched to its target with a force that was strong enough to make a cracking noise in the air for everyone to hear. The Black Knight though already saw it coming despite being busy a moment ago, his instinct already saw it far from it come. He quickly bent his body, avoiding the spiky ball, then his hand lunged forward, grabbing the chain and he pulled it. His enormous strength was more than enough to cause the blue oni to be pulled at him, and he already sprung forward when that happened, his black sword flashed, an eerie grin plastered over his face as the distance between them closed an instant. He noted the maid also extending her leg, attempting to kick him but it was useless, he knew that, she will die with a swing of his sword before her leg reach him, with that thought he swung the dark sword and... Clang! Only for him to feel as if he's swinging a sword against a fortress. What the dash! Before he could think any further his instinct screamed and he obeyed it, he took steps back just in time to avoid the kick that was about to hit his face, however the blue-haired maid did not let him go so easily. She keeps pushing forward and delivers blow after blows to the black knight. Punches, kicks, all of them launched at him with high mastery and skill. Jormungandr meanwhile is still unable to regain his composure, however that doesn't mean he is defenseless. He brings his sword, countering the attack, 
however much to his shock instead of her flesh being cut or sliced, they all meet equal resistance just like his first strike, and because of that, he found himself in defensive as Rem kept pushing him further. And at that time Amelia already recovered, she lunged forward, her cape already left behind, revealing golden armor with red fur that covered her figure. She joined Rem and started to deliver her own strike to the black armored man, the invisible sword flashed and coated by a mana, empowering it and the user, enchanting the strength behind her assault to another level. Even so the black knight is still not someone who is easy to be taken down, even in a stance that is unstable and facing skillful blows and strikes, he is still able to maneuver his move, parrying each of their attacks with graceful and smooth. However his expression no longer looked bored like before, his face showed that he started to take them seriously as he put over a thoughtful face and analytical eyes to the oni and half-elf that was pressing him. Fists and legs combined together with invisible swords to clash against dark obsidian blades. They trade about a hundred strikes only in a spawn of a few seconds, a testimony to their skills that have been honed after years of training and struggle, each of them practicing in their own way and now the result comes out. Had it not been a battle that was so painful and in dark condition, one might have found their fight to be beautiful. And one of them slipped a bit. Got you. Amelia wasted no time the moment she found herself free from their deadlock. She didn't allow Jormungandr to regain his full balance, she quickly cast a small spell and froze the ground beneath his greaves, and this made the man's footstep become imbalanced further, creating another hole in his opening. Rem happily takes this chance as she moves faster, her fist and legs become more aggressive, she flung forward her kick, then with one twist, she is able to grapple the edge of his sword, redirecting the black-colored weapon down. Then she spun and delivered a powerful toe kick that smacked to his face, producing a satisfying crack and gouging out part of his flesh as if her leg were a sharp knife. It was like a beautiful painting and good music to her eyes and ears. As he let out a howl of pain and stumbling, Amelia did not let this slip up easily, mana exploded from her and she rushed forward, her wind sword screeching as it was reinforced, and with all her strength she swung it to his neck. Black obsidian magical energy surges out from the dark body once again but with a greater magnitude this time, creating an explosion that sends the man away from them the moment the invisible sword and his energy touch each other. Amelia clicked her tongue in distaste, her eyes narrowed in sharp manner as she stood properly, Rem also stood by her side. Did Amelia-sama? No, I did not get him. Amelia said with gritted teeth. He uses mana burst and it clashes against mine, thus making it explode. I only managed to cut part of his neck instead of total decapitation. She told her. Don't sell yourself that cheap, you still did well. Though, not like it going to work anyway. The half-elf bristled at the compliment from the Dark Knight who was now approaching them, his cheeks and jaw that gouged out already starting to recover, regrowing in unbelievable speed. The wound on his neck also lets out steam-like gas as it knits each other muscles, making it fully recover. I had lost half of my face or all of my brain in the past, yet I am still alive. You can even burn my entire body to ashes and I still will remain. The Black Knight said with dark amusement tinted his voice, but still. You managed to injure me to that extent, granted you have Excalibur with you but what surprises me more is you REM. He stares at the blue-haired maid who returns his gaze with a cold look, authority of greed. Really? How is that even possible? I mean, I'm pretty sure I ate Regulus and his whole wives so that power won't respawn. He mused aloud with a smirk, his gaze shifted back to Amelia, to her torso to be precise. And you planted on her, who is wearing that armor? This fight won't be as easy as he thought, the authority of greed that belongs to Regulus is the most troublesome one, it made the user invincible and also very deadly. Granted with only one heart perhaps Rem cannot use its power as full as Regulus, but it doesn't mean it still won't be effective. However, it also doesn't mean it will be hard. In comparison, perhaps the fight's difficulties would only increase by one level or less even. And then, there's mana burst as well. That woman taught you, didn't she? He continued with a smirk, he seems to be feeling pretty good despite knowing this battle won't be an easy one. She is pretty much dying, that is why she teaches you how to use mana burst, you are perhaps the only one who is able to do it with that large pool mana of yours. Amelia soars forward, magical energy explodes from her once again and she gives a powerful axe slash, which gets blocked easily. The man twists his hands and deflect the strike with a powerful yet controlled swing, making the woman lose her balance for a moment. He is about to continue but Rem comes from behind her, and the Dark Knight jumps back, avoiding fighting at close range with the maid. I'm in the middle of a monologue, how rude to interrupt. He said with a smirk. Where was I? Ah, yes, you. He stares at R.E.M., your mana. 
they practically raise. How? I mean. He concentrated further, focusing his eyes on the blue maid and his eyes widened as he realized what was going on, and he laughed, wahaha. That. That damn Pandora. She infuses Ram's horn with you, isn't she? She turned you into two horned oni. Rem only silence, not even attempting to deny it. The Witch of Vainglory indeed managed to fuse the remaining horn of her twin sister to her and thus give her a major boost of power, not just it make her able to take mana faster but it increased her physical abilities as well. Of course she tries to deny it at first when the witch brings what remains of her sister's horn to her, but in the end she accepts it as she knows just how critical and desperate their situation is right now. Surprise, surprise, it really surprises me, not just the authority of greed but that as well. He chuckled, then he turned to Amelia again, however his gaze quickly focused on the invisible sword and he no longer looked amused. That Excalibur. Something feels a bit strange with it. Excalibur. Amelia still remembers how it was given to her, it was when she finally stabilized and recovered from her mental breakdown, through Ram and Rem hard work, they managed to restore her condition, albeit it still scarred her, and she sure until she died it still will. This is. Ram. What is this? She asked as she stared at the sword, it was beautiful, beautiful beyond any words, as matter of fact, beautiful, seems to be an insult to describe a sword at this stature. The pink-haired Oni also stares at the sword, her usual stoic face was not there, her expression is soft and filled with nostalgia. This is sword that given by Aaron Sama for Amelia Sama. He wants you to have this when you are ready. This is his legacy for you. I. I. I don't. She gulped, eyeing the sword nervously. I don't deserve this. Yes you don't. Ram bluntly said, not even declining her denial. However that doesn't change the fact Aaron Sama has trusted you, so if you do not deserve this, then make yourself to be one. She told the half-elf. That was how much Amelia Sama owed him after all. This sword. Is a sword that will save the world. Amelia declared as she raised her sword. It is the sword that will kill you. The Dark Knight stared at her, then he looked at the sword, then his lips curled to smirk, you really think so? He asked in an amused voice, do you know, Satella, that this world is doomed? Even if you kill me, this world will end. This planet is dying, Gustico's life is numbered. The Ice Kingdom soon will melt and I already made sure there won't be any plants able to grow in other kingdoms' land. So what? Rem asked coldly. The world will end, just like you said perhaps, however know that there is no future for you as well. There is nothing waiting for you in the years that will come. She said, her ice blue eyes peering at the man's heterochromatic eyes. We might fail to save the world, but you can be sure that we will avengite. And today. Amelia raises Excalibur, the invisible sheath blaring and roaring, spewing out a gale of winds. Is the day where you die, monster. And the wind cleared after that, revealing the holy sword to the dying world. No longer styled like a western sword, the guard and the edge are combined together almost like a great sword, with a crystals-like design carved on its blade, its size also increased, becoming longer than its original form. Sword that saved the world. The Dark Knight mused while rolling his tongue. For a moment he only silences, then he explodes into a laugh, loud, guttural and manic, he laughed while clutching his forehead. Interesting. Interesting. Ha 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 ha. Then he pulled his hand, his face become feral, his heterochromatic eyes glowing in their own color, black malicious energy started to pour out from his whole body and the area surrounding him began to shift, blur, almost like off focus or Fata Morgana. Then, let us see. His voice is no longer smooth like before, now it becomes heavy, guttural, inhumane even with each word he speaks. Are you going to be heroes, or a food? The world explodes in the color of black. Amelia and Rem are forced to put their hands to their front as a massive gale of wind washes over them, followed by enormous amounts of mana that seem infinite. The darkness was like a flame as it was soaring and engulfing their surroundings, like a black hole that swallowed reality, and it took everything the duo had to not be blown or absorbed by them. And then it came out. A gigantic dark scaled hand with red veins that pulsing, its size alone is enough to make the duo look so small, its claws practically tripling their size in length. It turned the ground into chunks of debris and burned them into boiling earth just by the sheer heat it radiated. Then the head came out. Dark scaled as well with red veins, long like a serpentine, with a reptilian face. The maw though not only stopped in its jaw, it kept going further until it reached its neck, showing fangs that protrude outward. 
Nine mismatched eyes with mixture of crimson blood and amber gold humming with power. Spikes protruding out from the back of his reptilian head, spread through his back as well. The wings come out the third, gigantic, enormous even, making his arm look small as they block the sun that shone upon the world. That like in style with crimson red as the color of its fiber, and there are also spikes on each end of the wings. And finally the legs and the tails. Just like his hands, it is more like talon than a foot, dark scaled with red veins that pulsing as if they were breathing. Its long tail protruding spikes on the tip and on top of it. This is the true form of the dubbed Jormungandr, previously known as Aaron Pendragon, this is the beast that is responsible for turning the world into living hell. And then he opens his maw, and it stretches, stretching further until his scaly neck also opens, revealing serrated and missorted fangs that surpass them in height with saliva and drool dripping over them. Hero Amelia, the half-elf and Rem the strongest oni in history. Come and show me your strength. Amelia clutches Excalibur tightly, even though she already braces herself but she still feels fear just by standing in front of the monster before them, she can feel there are parts of her screaming at her to run away and escape right now. But she ignores it and turns to Rem. Ready Rem? She asked. Rem gave her a measuring look, then she smiled at her. Anytime, Amelia-sama. How about you? Amelia shifted her gaze back to the monster that was now towering them like men before snails, Excalibur humming with her mana and she smirked. I'm demonically possessed. The monster let out a roar that shook the whole world and shattered eardrums as he craned his long neck and glared down at the heroes, his fangs bared to them. In response, the half-elf and the demon jump forward, intent to end the nightmare that has terrorizing the world for years. Hashtag data sheet hashtag identity, Aaron Wilson slash Pendragon slash Jormungandr. Alignment, Chaotic Evil Class, Beast Height, 177 cm, 1001000 m, Weight, 80 kg, Question Mark. Strength, A, A++++, Endurance, A+, A++++++, Agility, B, B- Mana, EX, EX, Luck? N, Phantasm. Hashtag Class Skills Hashtag Magic Resistance, EX, Authority of the Beast, A, Hashtag personal skills hashtag instinct a eh, mana burst a plus the beast's class mana practically come from the world itself as long as there is mana in the world he won't run out of it and with source that limitless his mana burst becomes exceedingly strong it is not an exaggeration for him to be able to blow a part of the castle with a single punch with proper focus and enhancement clairvoyance beast see this skill allows aaron wilson slash pendragon slash jormungandr to see through the desire and truth of a human in front of him and reveal them. Monstrous strength, A++, in the circumstance of Aaron Wilson slash Pendragon slash Jormungandr. In his beast form, this skill is expressed at its highest level. As of assuming draconic form by way of reshaping the mana around him, he attains the strength of a titan that is on par with Tiamat, the mother of demonic beast. Self-modification, EX, Aaron Wilson slash Pendragon slash Jormungandr able to modify himself by reshaping his own mana and others that interact with him. This allows him to turn himself into a gigantic draconic creature of over 200 meters in length. In this form, he obtains immunity against any attacks lower than rank of A, hashtag noble phantasm hashtag the insatiable organism, cells that devour the world asterisk type, anti-world. Rank, EX asterisk further information cannot be revealed due to spoiler XP. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.